Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Dr. Kristen Stehauer, Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, and Chief Academic Officer for Northwood University. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the inaugural Freedom Week. And this is something that we hope will become a long-standing tradition, and you happen to be a part of the first one. This event, over the course of the week, will bring together 35 different speakers from nearly as many institutions from around the globe. Some will be presenting in person, and some will be presenting via technology. This is a carefully choreographed event and something that should be fast-paced and very thought-provoking. This week, we celebrate freedom and liberty by stimulating our minds and thinking about freedom and individual rights, as well as the personal responsibility that goes hand in hand with those freedoms. As a political scientist, my own research and areas of interest center closely on these very topics. So when Dr. Takarev approached us about this concept last summer as an idea, we were just delighted, and I personally was very interested and thank him for coming up with this idea that is coming to fruition tonight and over the course of this week. On this evening's uh, program, you will be exploring capitalism's spontaneous order with some world-class thinkers and speakers about this topic. On Tuesday, the agenda focuses on who protects the worker in the free market. And on Wednesday, you'll learn about liberty and the nanny state. Thursday, the rule of law and the Northwood idea. And Friday is Milton Friedman Day. Students, please take advantage of this. You will be exposed to world-class philosophers, entrepreneurs, politicians, economists, people who really, you're very fortunate to have the opportunity not only to hear, but also with whom to interact. Also, tell your friends about it, because this is something that we really don't want anybody to miss. Northwood University's mission, as you know, is to develop the future leaders of a global free enterprise society, and you are those leaders. You're going to be rubbing elbows this week with leaders who have distinguished themselves in many ways. And for that, we are just very, very indebted to Dr. Takarev for coming up with this idea. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize him as he's helping herd uh, things around. But Dr. Takarev, let's uh, recognize you for your contributions. We're not sure anything quite like this has ever been undertaken. And we know that this is a first for Northwood University. And we also thank all of the technical support that's involved with this. And this has been months in the making. And dozens of people have been involved. With our mission as a university, we're very unique. And we have a specific philosophy about the benefits of free markets, individual freedom, and personal responsibility. And this week celebrates all of those things. Learn as much as you can. and. Perhaps it will change your life. We urge you to take action on the ideas and thoughts that you'll be developing over the course of this week. So thank you for being here. And it is my privilege to, um, to introduce Dr. Alexander Takarev, Professor of Economics at Northwood University. Thank you, Kristen. It's, uh, it's a dream come true for me. I, if I have to thank everyone personally who contributed something to this uh, series of uh, wonderful events, I'll have to take the whole evening. So um, I'll thank God for giving me the opportunity to bring all these wonderful people to you, uh, to this school, and to the world through the uh, means of uh, technology. What do we have to look for tonight? I'll give you the list. We have uh, the Mises Institute's Mark Thornton. We have the IHS Institute, Mario Villarreal Diaz. We have the Institute for Justice, Greg Reed. We have the King's College, David Innes. The President of the International Society for Individual Liberty, Ken Schooland. We have the Founder and President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, Jacob Hornberger, we have the American Legislative Exchange Council's Jonathan Williams, we have the president and founder of the Acton Institute, the Reverend Robert Sirico, 
We have the director and founder of the Adam Smith Institute in the United Kingdom, Eamon Butler. And last but not least, we have the president of the Hayek Institute in Vienna, director of the Austrian Economic Center and founder of the Free Market Roadshow, Barbara Kohn. This past week, I went to a uh, conference in uh, Indianapolis, and uh, we had wonderful speakers there too. And uh, we talked about uh, the free markets, and perhaps you know that uh, there isn't just one flavor of free market philosophy. Uh, there's people that are um, labeled conservatives and those that define themselves as libertarian. So what is the difference, in case you don't know, how to distinguish between the two groups of free market thinkers? We will have some of the leading conservatives and libertarians tonight, tomorrow, on Wednesday, Thursday. How do you distinguish? Well, if you, uh, if you ask the following question to uh, a libertarian, how many of you guys, how many libertarians uh, are necessary to change a light bulb? Well, the correct answer will be none. The market will take care of it. But if you ask a conservative how many light bulbs, I'm sorry, how many conservatives are necessary to change a light bulb, the correct answer will be change. So, without further ado, I will start um, our night with Mark Thornton from the Mises Institute in Alabama. Mark, do we have a connection? I will move to the camera on that side. Go ahead, Mark. Good evening. How's the thing? Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, hello and good evening. Uh, I, of course, want to thank Northwood University for the invitation to participate in Freedom Week and, of course, for the students' time and attention here tonight. It all begins with Mises. It is very fitting that we begin this very important Freedom event with Ludwig von Mises, the economist from Austria. Mises was where the modern free market libertarian intellectual movement began. He stands between the old classical liberal European movement and the birth of libertarianism in America. And also the birth of anarcho-capitalism and its movement is also firmly associated with his student, Murray Rothbard. The work of both men and its promotion is the mission of the Ludwig von Mises Institute 
located in Auburn, Alabama. Now Mises' economic analysis comes to the conclusions that the only rational economic policy for the human race is a policy of unrestricted free markets and private property. The government should be strictly limited to the defense of people and property within its borders. He established three main points. First, free markets, the division of labor, and private property and investment are the only path to prosperity for the human race. Second, socialism would be a disastrous uh, for a modern economy because rational pricing would be impossible. In contrast, during Mises's career, most intellectuals assumed that socialism was the wave of the future. And third, government intervention hampers and cripples the market, it's counterproductive, and it inevitably leads to socialism unless the entire interventionist regime is repealed. Over Mises' long and productive career, he systematically built the intellectual defense of capitalism and civilization. Capitalism was go both good for the capitalist as well as for labor, and thus the free society was one of a harmony of social interests. In his first major work, The Theory of Money and Credit, published in 1912, it was the first book to integrate macroeconomics, the overall economy, with microeconomics, or individual markets. In his monetary theory, Mises revived the long-forgotten currency school principle that society does not benefit from an increase in the money supply. He showed that an increase in the money or in bank credit caused price inflation in the economy as well as business cycles. Mises was the foremost advocate of the classical gold standard as the only sensible monetary system. Mises crafted what has become known as the Austrian business cycle theory. And here, if a central bank artificially lowers the interest rate and increases the supply of loans beyond the supply of savings, it's going to cause an artificial boom in the economy. The lower interest rate makes entrepreneurs think that savings has increased and encourages them to invest more in the future. And hence, they collectively make investment mistakes that will be revealed as a cluster of errors during the inevitable bust or correction, often now referred to as a recession or depression. In contrast, Keynesian economists believe that business cycles have a non-economic cause, the ebb and flow of psychologically induced optimism and pessimism. Mises' student, Friedrich von Hayek, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his contributions that extended Mises' business cycle analysis. Mises and Hayek developed the Austrian theory of the business cycle in the 1920s and led them to predict the Great Depression. It also set the stage for a battle with John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s. However, the Keynesians won the field because the rise of fascism and Nazism in Europe led to the destruction and dispersion of the Austrian economists who had to flee their country when Hitler invaded. When the German in, with the German invasion of Austria, a special military intelligence Gestapo team was dispatched to Mises' apartment in Vienna, but Mises was long gone from Austria, but they apparently did take all of Mises' personal and scientific papers. And that's the, the idea that Mises was a, a significant um, intellect, intellectual in Europe prior to World War II. Long thought to have been lost, Mises' papers were found in a secret KGB warehouse outside of Moscow after the downfall of the Soviet Union. Apparently, the Nazis thought Mises had discovered and was hiding a secret that would make their socialism work. So he brought his papers back to Berlin to study. And then when the Russians, the Soviets, invaded Berlin at the end of World War II, they also thought Mises had a secret for making socialism work, so they brought the papers back to Moscow. Of course, both of those groups were wrong. Socialism doesn't work. Now, with the Austrian economists scattered throughout the world and unorganized, the Austrian school went into a deep decline. After World War II, living in the U.S., Mises continued to reform economics on a purely scientific basis 
producing some 20 books on the subject over his career. However, most of his scattered disciples chose to enter different disciplines, write about different subject matters, or were even completely won over by mainstream economics. And only in recent decades has there been a real resurgence of interest in Austrian economics. And while still a small minority, it is the fastest growing school of economic thought. Austrian economics is a dynamic and growing movement committed to explaining the world and identifying the source of its economic problems. The Ludwig von Mises Institute is dedicated to the promotion of Austrian economics as developed by Mises and his students such as Friedrich Hayek and Murray Rothbard. The Mises Institute was founded in 1982 by Lou Rockwell and is located in Auburn, Alabama. The Mises Institute publishes scholarly journals and books and teaches classes in Austrian economics. The Institute holds conferences on Austrian economics on a variety of subjects dedicated to a wide variety of audience. Our website is one of the largest and most accessible economic web pages in the world, mises.org. Uh, we have a Mises University conference, a week-long conference in Austrian economics for undergraduate students. We have a Mises Academy for short web-based courses on Austrian economics. We have the Rothbard Graduate Seminar, which is a week-long conference in Austrian economics for graduate students. And we have the Austrian Economics Research Conference, which is for academics and professionals. We also hold Mises Circle events, which are one-day introductory courses for the general public. We have a bookstore where you have all of the books on Austrian economics, e-books, t-shirts, ties, um, just about anything that's related to Austrian economics is on the Mises Bookstore. We also publish the quarterly journal of Austrian economics and the free market newsletter, which is free and available for everybody. The Mises Institute is the global center for Austrian economics, but there are now more than 20 independent Mises Institutes around the world, as well as many fine institutions which promote Austrian economics, many of which are here for you at Freedom Week. So please check us out at M-I-S-E-S -E dot O-R-G and help turn Freedom Week into freedom for the rest of your life. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for uh, speaking to us tonight. I was curious if the Mises Institute has any particular strategy or plan for trying to um, uh, getting Austrian economics to infiltrate into uh, government or politics at all. Uh, yes, we do have a plan. Uh, we do have an approach, I should say. And we firmly believe that ideology has to precede uh, government influence and policy change. So we believe that a lot of people in society have to be intellectually moved and ideologically moved in order to support real political change. And that's why we're in the business of educating people, as well as a lot of the other things that are going on at Freedom Week. We need to make sure that there's a, a strong base of support within society that supports the ideology of a free society. And then once that happens, we're more or less guaranteed to gain um, political reform. And so we, you know, we see this throughout history uh, that very often it's a very short period of time when a large number of people become influenced in an ideology and then you see quick, dramatic political change such as uh, the American Revolution and such as the downfall, downfall of the Soviet Union. It's a great question though. Thank you, Evan. Questions? I have one question. Uh, Mark, if, uh, if Professor Mises were alive today and if he uh, could evaluate the policies of the U.S. government of the last several years, which, which three decisions do you think would have been the most criticized by him? Well, there's no question that his response to this economic crisis would be that he would be totally against 
the Federal Reserve's manipulating the interest rate and the quantitative easing, you would be totally against uh, bailing out various firms, um, various industries uh, in the economy. He felt that you shouldn't have a, a, a fiscal policy response, you shouldn't have a monetary policy response, you should have unrestricted uh, free market uh, leading to uh, structural changes in the economy. So uh, he would not advocate bailing out industries, bailing out firms, uh, and using monetary policy to keep uh, otherwise bankrupt institutions afloat. So he would be totally against all this, but I think he would also um, take a great deal of pride and solace in the fact that there are 21 Mises Institutes around the world and that there's an active movement to restore uh, the gold standard and that Ron Paul's campaign uh, to audit the Fed and uh, to take away power from the Federal Reserve uh, have gained so much strength. And that in particular, so many young people uh, are interested in the ideas that the great Aust Austrian economists have been promoting uh, for so long. I think that he would uh, be both pleased at all of those developments and be arguing very forcefully against what the Federal Reserve and the federal government have been doing uh, to undermine the recovery from this economic crisis. Speaking of the uh, Federal Reserve and uh, Ron Paul's uh, attempt to um, bring it under scrutiny from Congress, do you think that it might backfire, um, putting political pressure uh, in an expansionary way, making the Fed even more irresponsible in times of crisis if we would bring it under the scrutiny of a congressional committee, unless it's all Ron Paul's uh, on that committee, of course. Well, I'm always suspicion, suspicious of what the politicians might do and what central makers might do, but it's hard to imagine them being even more irresponsible than they've been in terms of keeping interest rates at uh, almost zero level for so many years, expanding their balance sheet by several hundred percent, uh, and all the undermining, uh, underhanded manipulations that they've done to backstop um, uh, various industries, uh, even in terms of uh, backstopping uh, foreign banks. So it's, it's almost hard to imagine that they could get even worse, but I have to agree with you, Professor. Um, these are pretty nefarious people sometimes, and they have some very bad ideas uh, about how the economy works and how to fix it. And I think you need Austrian uh, economics to tell you why an economy isn't performing as well as how does an, an economy right itself and correct itself and in the view of Austrian economics it's only entrepreneurs that can actually fix an economy and get labor and capital back together again producing goods and services and, uh, and producing wages profits uh, and correcting all of the misallocations in the economy that occurred uh, from 2001 into 2007, particularly and noteworthy in the, in the housing markets. Um, and so the, the Federal Reserve's response has been uh, worse than I could have ever imagined. And, and so I'm hopeful that more scrutiny will, uh, will produce a better result rather than a worse result. Thank you, Professor Thornton. Thank you, Let's thank him one more time. Thank you, and have a good week with uh, Freedom Week. Thank you. It's a pleasure Thank to be you. with you. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Next on our list is uh, Mario Villarreal Diaz from the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. Mario? Do we have the connection ready? Can you hear me? Hi, Alex. Can you see me and hear me well? I hear you well. I see you. These are my students. Do you see them? I can see them and I can see you. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. 10 minutes and uh, when you get to uh, only five, I'll give you a signal if I have to. 
Uh, the students All right. approach this microphone if they have any questions. At the end, if you leave them in time, if not, they'll send emails and you can answer in that format. Thank you, Mario. Good, good, good. I hope that I don't see people uh, leaving the, the room before I finish. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks thanks to Northwood University first, and of course, thanks to Alex uh, uh, Tugarev, Professor Alex Tugarev, for the invitation to be part of Freedom Week. This is a fantastic idea and a fantastic event, and I'm really, really glad to be part of it. Now, when Alex asked me to talk about a spontaneous order, I thought uh, that it was a very, very good choice uh, for uh, starting the, the, the events and the topics. Now, uh, by organizing this conference, uh, Professor Tokarev not only provided me with a good speaking engagement and exciting opportunity to talk to all of you, but also provided me with a good starting point for my talk. Now, certain activities work well when someone is directly responsible and in charge. For example, organizing this conference. The central planning of the event included many and several aspects on coordinated actions, namely to decide topics and lectures, speakers, the order of the narrative that was to be presented, determine times, contents, participants, the promotion of the event, the timing of the event, work with the logistical aspects of it, the technological aspects of it, reserve the room, etc., etc. So you get the picture, right? So to choose a goal, what needed to be explored, the expected outcome of it. But the results of all these things that I just described is a planned order, right? It's something that your professors plan, and the result is this conference. Now, individuals plan all the time. You guys plan what to wear today, what to eat. Uh, if you're studying, what subject to study first, what materials to revise first, with whom you would like to do that, uh, what to do so you could attend this conference, several things. And when we see all these orders emerging all the time in different aspects of our lives, we see patterns, right? We see patterns in how people walk to classes in your campus. We see patterns in traffic, how you guys see at this conference room. And we see patterns on how people interact in Sunday markets. We see patterns all the time. Now, First key concept, when we see a pattern, we tend to assume that somebody, someone, order it. Someone must be in charge of arranging things in such a way that produce the outcome we see. Yet, a lot of outcomes and orders we see every day are not the product of someone being centrally in charge. For example, I, I want to share a story with you. Uh, the, uh, when the Soviet Union still existed, the, there was a minister of prices, believe it or not. It was in charge of setting prices of goods and services. So the, the, the minister of prices visited London and met with the closest counterpart, which was the minister of finance there. And uh, uh, the minister of finance was showing him things around London. And at some point, uh, the Soviet uh, minister of, of, of prices asked, uh, asked the, the, the London minister, who is in charge of the distribution of milk I don't know if it was milk or bread or something like that in London. And one thing you think of it like, you don't know what is more dramatic or extraordinary, the question, who is in charge, who is responsible for the distribution and production of milk or bread in, in a city like London. But the answer, which is no one centrally, because that's the answer, no one centrally. So think about what happens when we have vast amounts of information, inputs, different goals and objectives, different preferences, resources, more pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. The ability of central planners to coordinate collective action rapidly decreases. So yet, we see complex orders and patterns emerging all the time. So examples, uh, simple examples are patterns of a group of people at a concert or a lecture hall, that's like this one. More complex examples are traffic patterns or even language. Right? Language isn't a spontaneous, it's, it's, it's a pattern that emerged with no one being directly in charge. Products and exchanges in a marketplace. These orders have no central authority in charge. They evolve and are the result of countless individual interactions, which results not always are fully predictable. So 
They are the result of human action, but not of human design. And they involve the processing and coordination of amazing amounts of activities, information, and resources. Even some familiar activities that may look simple require massive amounts of coordination and cooperation among hundreds of individuals. For example, making something as simple as a pencil. In 1958, Leonard Reed crafted a marvelous story that captures the essence of the spontaneous order concept. You can check it, just Google it, I pencil uh, the movie, and you can see it in, in, in YouTube. It's fantastic. It's really, really, really nice. So work with me here. Think about a pencil, right? That's what Leona Reed invites the reader to do, to think about what implies this apparently simple task of making a pencil. What do we need? We need graphite, we need wood, metal, and rubber. Simple, right? Well, yet no single person in the world could make a pencil on his or her own. So imagine beyond the materials needed, all the persons, often from all over the world, involved in the making of a pencil. Think about the first steps, cutting the trees, the wood the tools needed to cut the trees, like the steel needed to make the tools, the electricity needed to power the tools, getting the wood then, cleaning the tree, transporting the logs, the coffee, the person that is making the coffee for the driver transporting the, the logs, the truck, who made the truck that's transporting the logs, right, who make the roads, who made the tires, who make uh, the materials needed for the logistics of the transportation system and processing. Same applies for the graphite, the mines, right? The, the, technique, the tools, the lights on the mines, the rails, right? The transportation again. Then they arrive to the factory. Now, now think about the, the, the manufacturing process itself. And I didn't talk about the rubber and the metal, right? But think about all the people involved with these activities and all the things they have to do in order to produce a pencil. Boxing it, like printing the boxes, the branding, uh, sending to the stores, displaying it, all the things. So there is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and et cetera. We can stay here and talk for 30 minutes just about this. Now, it should be obvious to all of us that there is not a pencil SAR in the sense like I think the President Obama just appointed an, an Ebola SAR. Not sure it's going to work that well, but like there's not a pencil SAR. There's not a single mind in charge of ordering all these activities that we just described, resource allocation, times, movement, production processes, transportation logistics, marketing strategies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and we can continue with et cetera. And yet, for less than 50 cents, you can buy a pencil. Order emerges in the form of a pencil. For some more money, you could buy a gallon of milk or a box of chocolate or an iPad all the results of similar complex systems of interactions. The pencil, the milk, the chocolate, the iPad, and a myriad other products are the result of voluntary interactions and cooperation encounters of countless individuals, free individuals. Valuable knowledge about how to arrange things, assign resources, and all the things we just described is dispersed among these individuals, thousands of individuals. This total knowledge cannot be known to a single mind. Therefore, it cannot be effectively planned centrally. In a market, this knowledge is shared and revealed through the process of exchange guided by the price system. It is a price system that conveys all the necessary information individuals need to know how effectively they are assigning the resources and the skills. So think about price increases. Price increases signal things are scarce and thus valuable and should be treated as such. Maybe this triggers a company to reconsider their production process and develop new technology. Maybe it attracts new companies that develop better products and competition will be, bring more and better products uh, that gain the favor of consumers. Similarly, if a price of something goes down, it also sends a valuable signal to consumers and producers. Consumers may shift their purchases to the more affordable good. In turn, producers of rival products may react by lowering the price or offering a better service. There are several possibilities with this uh, 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 example that we are talking about. I'm not going to explore all of them, but the message is the same. The price system is a signaling mechanism that guides and informs individuals making mutually beneficial exchanges in the market. And by doing so, it shapes a spontaneous order outcomes. This simply cannot be centrally planned. And if tried to, if somebody tries to centrally plan, 
the results are often inefficient and not comparable with the order that emerges spontaneously. Now, some of the more complex outcomes we see every day are not there because someone was directly in charge. There is spontaneous order, orders that result from human action but not sinful design. Now, what brings order to this situation, right? It seems that chaos should be the norm. The answer emerges from the incentive structure that people face when making choices. Economists suggest that the concept of the pursuit of self-interest may be part of the answer. Now think about the example of I pencil. All the ball parts are not thinking necessarily that I, I need a pencil, but they are thinking that them, about themselves, the loved ones, their paycheck, and their needs they have to be satisfied, right? These voluntary mutual beneficial exchange make possible for them to av advance their own interests. And as a result, they advance their interests of others as well. It's a process of trial and error, profit and losses that brings up spontaneous orders that we see in free societies. Now, I'm going to end by briefly discussing why is this important. This is important because the distinction is crucial in estimating the probability of planned orders succeeding in delivering desirable results. Even the best intentioned central planner do not possess all the necessary information and cognitive capacities to plan something that even resembles a market. We believe that central planners can design and operate complex systems, social systems especially, like the pieces of a chessboard on a, uh, is not only misleading, but dangerous. Uh, so it is important to stress out here that this is not to advocate not planning at all. That would be foolish and naive. In a free society, individuals plan by deciding how to better use their talent and skills to advance their goals. Therefore, the opposite of central planning is not no planning, but decentralized plan. Planning done by countless of individuals pursuing their own, their own self-interest. If we don't understand a spontaneous order, it is difficult to understand how markets work, how social norms evolve, and how why it's dangerous to believe it's always possible to centrally design solutions to today's complex social problems. In fact, Hayek believed that the curious, and I quote Hayek, the curious ta task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. So who's in charge of language, social norms, and market exchanges and prices? Anyone in general, but no one in particular, and that it works all the time very well. So this is the beauty and mystery of a spontaneous order. If you want to know more, Check our webpage, www.theihs.org. And especially if you're interested in a career in academia, make sure you let me know. We have resources to help you uh, with this. So I hope that uh, within these 13 minutes, uh, I was able to share with you a good idea about what an spontaneous order is and why it's important that we know and grasp the concept very well. So, Alex, I don't know if we have time for a question or two. The questions, guys. We have a couple of minutes. I would like to um, ask you, uh, in order to uh, uh, raise more interest and uh, lead them to uh, check out your website, uh, if you could uh, briefly describe what the, uh, what the goal is, what the mission statement is, what you are working on at the IHS. Thank you very much, Alex. Yes, of course. At IHS, uh, uh, we are an educational organization. We believe in, uh, uh, that the way to advance a free and prosperous society is by developing the careers of intellectuals and other individuals interested in the uh, world of ideas. So in that sense, we have uh, three main resources that help in exploring the ideas of liberty, particularly if you want to go to grad school. Uh, we have uh, uh, financial resources, we have scholarships, we have money to help you with that. We have um, events like seminars and workshops where we explore the ideas of liberty and we also explore uh, a career development aspects of how to publish, how to present at conferences, how to navigate a grad school, how to be more productive. And finally, we have dedicated mentoring. So if you think that grad school is for you or you're interested in exploring these ideas uh, in depth, please make sure that you contact me. Uh, I work with, mainly with uh, students in economics, but we work also with students in political science and we work with students in philosophy and history. So um, uh, think of us as a resource. We also have an initiative called Learn Liberty that probably some of you are familiar with. We have plenty of videos exploring the ideas of liberty online, so you can check that as well. But uh, uh, I hope we can continue this conversation. Uh, that, is, that is fantastic, Alex. All right, thanks to you. Thanks for the invitation. Good luck to, to you with this week, guys. Thank you. Thanks for your time.
Okay, next. Uh, our list is uh, Greg Lee. Do we have the connection? Hi, Greg. Hi, Professor Joker. Can you hear me well? Yes. Do you see my students? I can, absolutely. Perfect. Um, you can start anytime you want. Uh, if uh, you only have five minutes left, I will give you the signal. That sounds perfect. Thanks so much. My name is Greg Reed, and I'm an attorney for the Institute for Justice, which is a libertarian, pro bono, civil liberties law firm dedicated to representing individuals in defense of their fundamental constitutional rights against government intrusion and government violation of those rights. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you about an issue that I think is fundamental to the promise of this country and also fundamental to defining our relationship with government. Uh, but how my speech will differ uh, than the speakers that preceded me and probably the speakers that will follow me is that while many of them will talk about ideas of liberty or philosophies of liberty or policies for liberty, I'm going to talk to you about a tool for liberty and how you might rely upon towards that tool for achieving liberty um, every day. Uh, the topic of my conversation is the intersection of your constitutional rights and entrepreneurship and specifically your constitutional right to economic liberty. And let me be clear that when I ref talk about or refer to entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs, I want to let you know that I'm not only referring to the small business owner or the individual that starts a business. Undoubtedly, they are entrepreneurs. But I believe that all of us can be entrepreneurs or in our own way entrepreneurial in pursuing our professional careers. We can choose the industries we work in. We can choose the professions we pursue. And moreover, we can be entrepreneurial in the opportunities we create and the opportunities we take advantage of. Regardless of whether you think yourself, think of yourself as an entrepreneur or maybe one day hope to be an entrepreneur, every individual has a constitutional right to economic liberty. Now, I was preparing my remarks for this evening's talk and the thought occurred to me that maybe I was not giving you all credit. You are all, after all, attendees of Northwood University's Freedom Week. And so before I start prattling on about economic liberty, let me ask a question and perhaps you can show me by, uh, you can show me by a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with the fact that the Constitution protects your right to economic liberty? That looks like a, that's a pretty good showing of hands, uh, and I'm impressed. Because unfortunately today, most Americans aren't aware of the fact that they actually have a constitutional right to economic liberty. And that constitutional right is embodied in the 14th Amendment. And their lack of knowledge and the lack of emphasis on that constitutional right has resulted in rampant government violation at all levels, the state, local, and federal levels, of your ability to pursue with effectively the American dream. From our earliest days, we're taught that if we put our mind to it, we can be anything we want. We can achieve any goal that we're committed towards. Economic liberty is the legal embodiment of that dream. Here at the Institute for Justice, we, when we talk about the right to economic liberty, we talk about the right of an individual, of every individual, to pursue the occupation of their choice free from arbitrary and irrelevant government regulation. And that is basically, as you kind of boil it down, the American dream, the idea that we can do and be anything if we're committed towards it. And yet today, most people don't have the opportunity or the ability to fully exercise that right. For example, in the 1950s, less than 5% of the workforce had to acquire an occupational license or a license prior to pursuing their occupation of choice. Today that, today that number is over 30%. Another example of how government regulation has infringed upon 
not just the small business owner, not just um, some people's right to economic liberty, is, is this simple comparison. If I were to ask you, what was the similarity between an African style hair braider in St. Louis, Missouri, Benedictine monks in Louisiana, Uber, sidecar, or Lyft independent drivers in let's say the city of Chicago, or even Elon Musk, founder and CEO of Tesla, it'd probably be hard to connect the dots. But in reality, each one of these individuals have had their right to economic liberty violated by onerous, arbitrary, and irrelevant government regulations. Let me, for example, turn to that St. Louis, Missouri, African-style hair braider, someone who I know personally and who is a client of the Institute for Justice. Tamika Steyers is now the owner of a beautiful new African-style hair braiding salon called Locks of Glory. It's on a main street just outside of Saint, downtown St. Louis, and it is her dream come true. It is her American dream. But for many years, she operated her shop out of the back of her house. And she did so for two reasons. The first reason was because opportunities, jobs, and businesses like African-style hair braiding are low cost, low, low, overhead, uh, low overhead jobs or low, over, low overhead businesses, which allow her to earn valuable income and provide financial support for her family, all within the confines and comfort of her home. Really, to be an African-style hair braider, someone who locks, twists, weaves, or braids hair, and often what we call highly textured hair, all you really need are the skills to perform those services and a chair for your customer to sit in. But there's a second reason why she performed her services to her loyal customers and her local community out of the back of her home rather than in a shop originally. And that is because in the state of Missouri, it is illegal to put your two hands on someone's hair for the purpose of styling and for compensation without, without receiving a cosmetology license first. And if that doesn't sound ridiculous enough for you, in order to obtain a cosmetology license in the state of Missouri, you need to undergo 1,500 hours, 1,500 hours of training, most of which are irrelevant. You need to pass a cosmetology licensing exam, which would take you several years, and the whole process can cost you tens of thousands of dollars. At cosmetology school, you learn how to use chemicals to straighten, relax, and dye hair. You learn how to cut hair. You learn even how to perform hand, arm, and facial massages. But none of that's relevant to African-style hair braiding, which is a form of natural hair care, where simply someone might use uh, nothing more complex than a pick or a hairbrush, and then use their skills to make incredible, stylish, and culturally expressive hairstyles. But Tamika Steigers would have to go through all of that in order just to provide this simple, simple service that's been practiced for thousands of years safely by people all over the world. That's an example of what it means when a government overreaches, when regulations infringe upon an individual's right to economic liberty. And it's not just uh, limited to individuals like Tamika Steigers and small business owners. Those Benedictine monks in Louisiana they wanted to sell caskets, caskets that met all the legal requirements, but they were told that they were not allowed to sell caskets unless they had a full funeral service operation. They had a place in which they could embalm the body, they had mourning rooms, and they had a funeral director. And these Benedictine monks, which used their proceeds from selling these simple wooden caskets, simple, um, simply wanted to provide customers with a meaningful and simple product by which they might be able to honor their loved ones as they saw fit. Taxi drivers are battling Uber, Lyft, and sidecar drivers all over the country because apparently in order to provide a valuable service such as bringing one person from point A to point B in a timely fashion, you need a credit card swiper in the actual machine. But as you and I know, as technology allows us to pay for these things remotely. That's a regulation that is arbitrary and irrelevant to someone deciding that they want to earn some extra money and curry people between two destinations. And even Elon Musk, a billionaire, a celebrity of the green movement and of the liberal left, has been subjected to onerous and arbitrary regulations. He preferred to sell his cars direct to consumer, not using big showrooms, 
and not relying upon the traditional car dealership franchise service centers. But in many states, including recently in Michigan, the government has imposed regulations that says, no, if you want to sell your product, you have to sell it through a franchise dealership. The law actually requires the car manufacturer to put a middleman between you, uh, between you and, the, and the car seller. And that would apply to every car dealership, but Tesla is attempting an innovative model to improve customer service, to improve the sales experience, and to improve the ownership experience. So the question is, how did we get here? Certainly the founders of this country didn't envision this level of regulation that made people just trying to earn a better living for their families to jump through all these hoops in order to achieve the American dream. And unfortunately, it started 76 years ago when the United States Supreme Court decided that some rights were more important than other rights. There were fundamental rights, like your right to free speech, and then there were, I don't know, less important rights, like your right to economic liberty, like the right to actually pursue profession of your choice and earn money for your family. How that ever became less fundamental, I'm not sure. But 76 years ago, the United States Supreme Court decided that was less fundamental. But it got worse, unfortunately. But 17 years later, in 1955, the court also said that, you know what? Sure, your right to earn a living isn't a fundamental right. But more importantly, we're going to give government on the local, state, and federal level a blank check to regulate as it sees fit. And when someone brings them before the court of law and says, this is an unjust, this is an onerous regulation, the court's going to say, okay, well, government, what's your position? Why is it not unjust and not onerous? And the government might offer some excuses. They might offer some justifications. But here's where it gets really bad. At the standard the courts use today to evaluate regulations, which might, which might keep you from your business or your job, is such that, that the court is allowed to make up reasons for the government as to why that regulation should stay in place. They're allowed to make up excuses why the government can basically employ anti-competitive regulations that keep people from opening up new, business, new businesses and competing with existing providers. And so the question now is, what do we do today? Organizations like the Institute for Justice are bringing case after case in state and federal court challenging both the court's interpretation of these regulations and challenging these regulations outright. But this is a long battle that's going to last over many, many years. And so I'm coming to you with a request that you and your future will have the opportunity to maybe run a business or work in a business. You'll shape the way in which the business does business in the competitive marketplace. And you will have, and you will have the opportunity to ask your local government or ask federal government to regulate the competition, make it easier and safer for us to do business by keeping other people out. And I'm asking you, in the name of the founding of this country, in the name of freedom, to say, no, instead what we're going to do is provide a better service. In a competitive marketplace, we're going to improve what we provide to customers and compete that way. And together, hopefully with your efforts and the efforts of the organizations like the Institute for Justice, we will actually achieve freedom and economic liberty for all individuals of this country. Thank you very much. I'll ask a question. Uh, it's very popular. Everybody talks about justice, and uh, you call your institution the Institute for Justice. Um, That's right. We hear people, uh, obviously, when they start explaining it, uh, it's, it's evident they, they mean different things, uh, especially mm -hmm. those who are put in front of justice, the word social. What is social right. justice? I mean, what is real justice? What is your conception of justice? If you can explain that to my student. Sure, absolutely. And it's a difficult question because it applies in different ways in different settings. And an economist might think of what is just differently than I certainly would. But as an attorney and as a citizen, I think we can all expect this, that when we go before the court of law, we expect the court of law, we expect the judges to give us an honest shake. They shouldn't favor one side or the other. They certainly shouldn't be in the business of making up excuses and helping the government. We have actually seen cases 
where the attorney for the government has gone before the judges and said, you know what, Your Honor, I don't even need to provide you an excuse why this regulation is appropriate and constitutional. The standard that this court has to apply says it is if I say it is, and even if my reasons were bad, you would have to make up reasons why, they, why this regulation or this law should stay in place. Those uh, Benedictine monks that were trying to sell caskets to people who thought a simple burial was the best way to honor their loved ones, one of the regulations, one of the reasons why uh, the government said the regulations were legitimate was that the Benedictine monks might not be able to handle a situation where someone was particularly large. That we had to regulate who sold caskets because somehow the Benedictine monks couldn't make caskets to fit a larger body type. But that doesn't make any sense. Why would someone need an embalming room? Why would you need a whole funeral service operation? And unfortunately, courts more and more these days are recognizing that they do have an obligation to weigh the facts equally and give both sides an honest opportunity before the court of law. But unfortunately, even, if it's, even as it's improving, there are still many courts out there in many cases where people are not receiving the justice, the fair treatment before the courts that I think we all agree is appropriate and required. Thank you, Greg. Thank him. Thank you very much. Next on our list is my uh, former colleague from the King's College, Professor David Innes, who teaches political philosophy. Greetings from the King's College in New York City. I'm Professor David Innes, Associate Professor of Political Science, and I'm going to address the question of a Christian defense of limited government. In America, we have a system of limited government. It's limited in its powers and limited in its purpose. That doesn't mean that we hate government or that we view government as bad. It means that we respect government, both for its goodness as well as its dangers. People who don't respect the goodness of government are anarchists. They could just as well do without government entirely. People who don't respect the danger of government are statists. They think that government can and should do everything and address every problem, and there's no problem with that. So as such, both of these groups are themselves dangerous. The anarchists expose us to thugs, thugs on the street as well as thugs in the marketplace. The statists expose us to tyrants, including tyrants of a bureaucratic kind, powerful bureaucrats, unaccountable, who govern us for their own interests and not ours. These groups fail to appreciate one side or the other of what the founders did appreciate and what political theorists call the political problem. James Madison gave the political problem classic expression in Federalist Papers number 51, where he said, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. We need government because people have a tendency to violate each other, to threaten each other's lives, to violate each other's liberty, to take each other's property. And so we need government to restrain people from one another. The first half of the pro political problem is easy. You apply enough police, enough, <clears throat> pardon me, surveillance, uh, enough terror, and you can control people. But the tricky part is the second half of the political problem, obliging government to restrain itself. And this is necessary because the power of government to protect us is also the power to enslave us, just as the power of a doctor to heal you is also the power of a doctor to kill you. The power of a guard to secure your things is also the power of a guard to steal your things. 
So the basic question in government is, though we need guardians, who or what will guard us from the guardians? We could have a, a level of government on top of our government to restrain our government, and then we would need another level of government on top of that to restrain that government, and another government on top of that, and so on ad infinitum, and that's absurd. So Madison says that we have to oblige the government to restrain itself, but how does it do that? What the genius of the founders devised was uh, internal institutional means of doing this. So they would divide, they took government power and they divided it between different levels of government, federal, state, and local, and then took the government itself and divided it uh, between the, the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. And then they took the most powerful branch, the popular branch, the legislature, and divided that between an upper house and a lower house, uh, giving the two houses different constituencies, different uh, terms of election, uh, different responsibilities, and then within government set up a system of checks and balances, giving each branch the means and the motive to defend itself against encroachments from the others, uh, using ambition as Madison put it, ambition to counter ambition. So they gave each branch a share in the work of the other branches so they could check each other's power through jealousy. This was the founding design for limited government. Government was to be limited by the rights of the people. That is, uh, the, the, the rights of the people against government, providing a, a sphere, a private sphere, that government could not enter. Government was to be limited by laws. This government is government under law. It operates by the rule of law, especially a fundamental law, the Constitution. It's also limited by the consent of the people. Government is a trust. It, the people entrust power to the government for particular ends by their consent. And so it is limited. No one has a right to govern anyone else. But is free government limited only to securing us in our life and in our property and regulating property to secure us better in our health and life? Can it give no attention to the moral life and character of a people. And I know when you say government attending to the moral character of the people, uh, there are people on the right and left who, who panic and faint at the very thought of this. But can such a government, can a government that pays no attention to the moral life of the people sustain itself? Our second president, John Adams, didn't think it could. It is actually desirable for liberty that we mix religious influence with politics. President Adams, speaking to uh, the militia officers in, Mass officers in Massachusetts in 1798, said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Why would he say this? Why did he think this was true? These thoughts were common in 1798. They seem to be quite unpopular today. But was there sense in them? Are we missing something? Laws and institutions can go only so far in restraining people, in restraining rulers in particular. Laws cannot reach everywhere. It can't, they can't reach into the hearts of our rulers, and they can't reach into the dark corners of the back rooms where rulers are known to do things not in the public interest. Good character is a kind of internal policeman for both the rulers and the ruled. And when that 
internal policeman of good character is strong, then you don't need as much external policing. And government, accordingly, can be smaller, and people can be freer. But when that self-policing power of good character weakens and becomes rare, then people need ever more government. They need more regulation, and they need more aggressive policing to restrain them. The question for people who cherish the life of freedom under good government is this. What produces good character? It doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't come from our natural human goodness. If we had natural human goodness, we wouldn't need limited government. There wouldn't be a political problem. Let me suggest a few things. Good character, and some of this will just seem obvious to you, good character comes from discipline in the home. Uh, children raised with a stable family, with a mother and a father who are also of reasonably good character. Uh, a disciplined school environment dedicated to forming children into productive adults. Competitive sports play an important role. But as President Adams said, these will all erode in their moral force if there is not also a religious people. So while government should not establish one religion over another, that would not be good for government and it would not be good for religion. It should not show hostility to religion. Rather, it should pr protect, identify and protect the conditions that allow religion to flourish among people, or at least those forms of religion that are helpful to good character and thus to political liberty. Obviously, whatever religion is behind Al-Qaeda and ISIS just wouldn't do. A recent Pew poll showed that 49% of American adults believe that religion should have more influence in politics. That's up six points from 2007. Perhaps as government has become less limited, more controlling and more intrusive, and people notice their neighbors are more accepting of this, the respondents sensed that what Adams said about what limited government requires is true. Thank you very much. And, uh, is the president of the International Society for Individual Liberty, Ken Skoulund. Uh, good morning from uh, Hawaii. My name is Ken Skoulund. I'm an associate professor of economics at Hawaii Pacific University and the president of the International Society for Individual Liberty. I'm very glad to be talking to you today. I want to talk to you about um, a project that has been very important to me. I've worked uh, on it the past year and uh, I am still continuing to work on it. It has to do with, I guess you could say, abuses of eminent domain. In slide number two, you'll see that, well, eminent domain is a, is a case of uh, the presumed superior ownership of the government of anything that people uh, own that the government can take property from one private owner and give it to another private owner. Happens all the time in the United States. I think there's some 10,000 cases uh, in the United States where uh, the government is taking uh, property from one person and giving it to another person because they can presumably make uh, more productive use out of that property. Um, nowhere is that more abused than in China where people um, standing in the way of uh, government development uh, uh, taking their farming land that's been in their families for years um, as just um, really literally over other, other people's dead bodies. Um, now, in slide number three, I'm telling you about uh, the disputes that are going on in India, something I discovered last uh, January when I followed uh, the path to uh, the project by Liberty Institute and uh, Arches. Uh, or excuse me, ARCH, uh, the Action Research Community Health and Development uh, Institute, 
that are taking up the cause of a lot of people who are being dispossessed from their lands. Um, years ago, during colonial rule, uh, the British uh, marked out lots and lots of land that was uh, just going to be designated as forestry land, government land, and it pretty much ignored a long history of farmers uh, cultivating land, growing their crops, and making a livelihood out of the land uh, that they presumed was their, their own. Uh, the government of uh, Great Britain took this land, made forests out of it, and then when the independence came to India, it was transferred essentially to the government of India. And so people were still denied the access to these lands. From time to time, it gets in the news, as was the case when the Tata Motors uh, took a large piece of uh, land uh, to, uh, well, the government took a large piece of land to provide the Tata Motors company um, uh, facilities uh, for their, their Tata Motor car. Uh, but it ignored a lot of the farmers that had been working the land. They pulled out their guns, and of course the government responded with their guns, and it's led to a lot of uh, conflict and um, uh, bloodshed. Well, I decided to go down to, to Gujarat in the, India. Uh, in uh, uh, slide number five uh, shows uh, the friends of mine who greeted me there and, and uh, took me to show me around. In slide number six, I met um, Trupti uh, Mehta, uh, and uh, she was a woman who got her law degree in order to help the villagers to establish their rights to their land. Um, the case of uh, this community in, in uh, India is very revealing. It tells about how the farmers were abused and treated very badly by the forestry police and officials. Um, they never really had rights to anything that they own, as is so pervasive across the third world countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, the vast majority of farmers don't really have title, secure title to their lands. And so the government officials can push them around and brutalize them, basically uh, take their cattle, uh, take their crops, uh, force them into labor for doing the roads, um, and uh, they have no rights. They're treated as dirt. So a lot of the times these people live a very, very uh, bare existence on the side of the road, uh, eating roots and hovel, uh, uh, gathering around fires in the cold of winter, very little in the way of clothing. Their lives are very, very harsh indeed. Um, well, Trupti decided to sort of push back at one incident where the forestry officials stole six cattle from one villager. She gathered some 300 villagers, went to the headquarters of this forestry department in, in slide number six, and uh, decided to uh, take the cattle back. And the officials were outraged. They said, you can't do that. But finally, they, they just did. They said, you show us you have some right to these cattle, and we'll leave them alone. But otherwise, they belong to this farmer that grew them. Well, the next day, she was arrested and sent to jail. And uh, she took her case all the way to the high court in India, and it created a, a tremendous uh, popular outrage about what was going on. And the, Supreme, and the Superior, Supreme Court ruled with the villagers. They said, unless, unless the government authorities could show some justification, some reason that they have in taking this man's cattle, they have to give them back. Well, that started a whole new movement in the political arena. If they passed the forestry rights act which meant that uh, the 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 tens of thousands of farmers that were living as traditional uh, uh, farmers uh, tending the lands in these forest lands had a right to the land if they could designate what does uh, the 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 title of what land that they were working on uh, so troop d and Ambrish, her husband uh, set out to do this they took these uh, uh, handheld GPS uh, devices uh, that could set out uh, uh, from satellite tracking, uh, mapping out the coordinates of exactly how much land that they had uh, laid claim to because of what they were doing on the land and had traditionally been doing. They worked together with all the villagers to set out the claims for everybody in the village. And they came to an agreement on this before they would submit it to um, the 
the authorities to declare that this is their land that they've been working on. And uh, it, it takes uh, right now with all the training for these GPS devices and how to use them, how to mark out the coordinates, how to use the maps. It takes um, about a dollar per farm in order to establish these uh, these rights to to the title. Well, and then they they uh, submit these uh, uh, these claims to the government of officials. And um, right now, the government officials, for the most part, are denying the vast majority of these saying, well, these, uh, this can't be true. But they just push back. They say, well, unless you can tell us that you have some better way of designating how much land that they, that they have, uh, then you have to accept these. And the courts are starting to accept this uh, process. Now, in slide number uh, seven, you see where we've met together with uh, villagers um, at one meeting. I found that they were turning in surveys that they had done, uh, telling about how far their farms were from water sources, how much hot elevation there was uh, from, the, um, from the water source to make an uh, evaluation of how feasible it was to develop uh, uh, solar-powered irrigation systems. This was inconceivable before they had title to their land. Now, to give you an idea of how arbitrary this was, uh, look at slide number eight. It shows uh, a picture of three brothers. All of them had applied for uh, title to their land. why they were denied it, but the guy who was given title had some marking on the paper, it looked like a rectangle, it had no relationship to the, to the actual land that he had claimed, but it gave him a, a, a kind of rough title to it. Well, it's so arbitrary that the right to property, to property project is uh, taking out these maps. You'll see these maps in, uh, in uh, number slide 10. It shows the uh, uh, maps that are used uh, the, from GPS uh, satellite uh, images. Uh, slide number 11 shows how the, uh, the handheld uh, devices are used to make out these coordinates. And Ambrish is the one who then uh, computes this into the, in, into the computer uh, and uh, makes the documentation of this property rights. Uh, slide number 12 is another example of the training sessions that are used to, to help the farmers learn how to do this. Uh, 13 and 14 are slides that just generally show a, a nice gathering of the people that I met when I was there. Number, slide number 15 shows the tremendous improvements that are possible when these titles are secure. Uh, for example, you see in the pictures in slide number 15, the, the surveys that they turned in that uh, show uh, their calculations about uh, uh, the water source to, to make uh, an evaluation about the feasibility of solar-powered uh, irrigation. You see that uh, uh, the houses now are built of good, solid construction because they can invest their time and their energy and the resources in the development of houses that aren't just going to be torn down the next day by the government officials. They can, they can fence off their property so that crops can be grown without being taken by neighboring villagers or by the roaming wildlife. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, protections that can be done for the bamboo stands. I mean, if a bamboo is allowed to grow only a year, it, it's feed for the cattle. But if it can be sheltered and, and, and uh, shielded from uh, abuse for uh, three years, it can grow large enough to be become construction material, which can be cut and, and sold to earn an income. And also in uh, slide number 16, you see the abundance of corn that they've been growing in excess of their own particular needs, which they can sell in the communities to make a lot of extra income. And they're able to construct these uh, very substantial homes that uh, shield them from the winter, uh, the winter cold and the summer heat, and uh, provide extra lofts for, for storage. Um, and I, one of the, uh, at one of the moments with the crowd, I said, well, what is the 
difference now that you uh, face when you're being uh, encountering the officials and the authorities. And they and they just uh, they all laughed about it. They said, "Well, it, it's the difference between day and night." Uh, before we used to just get beaten up and pushed aside by the authorities. We were disregarded in every way and treated as animals. But now they treat us as equals. When we go to visit them, to talk to them, they invite us in and they serve us water, the, the, the mark of an equal. Uh, this is something that happens because they have the rights to their property. Um, <clears throat> in uh, slide number 17, I show probably the biggest important change for these farmers, the fact that they can um, earn an extra um, which are much, much better schools and they're able to learn the languages so they can come back and translate for their parents and uh, explain to the authorities what ailments they have, what kind of uh, requirements they need in terms of tools and equipment. Uh, they're able to teach uh, the kids by coming back with uh, medical experience and medical uh, training. They're able to go on to university and come back with engineering um, background. So these are the things that are transforming the lives of um, people in these communities. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would say that this is a uh, a, a, an excellent demonstration of the importance of property rights transforming the lives not only of this village but it shows holds the potential for transforming the lives in the greatest development possible for uh, the people across Asia across Latin America and across Africa where for the most part the general population ha is denied uh, the rights to develop their own land and it can transform their lives so I hope that this has provided an, an interesting uh, and valuable project for you, uh, an example of the value of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, how it derives from property rights. Uh, there is more that I could say about the uh, India Schools Project. India Institute is conducting research in uh, uh, schools across India, noting that the vast majority of education is taking place in the unregistered um, uh, private schools, and they are being shut down by the government uh, in favor of government schools, which is a very, very tragic thing because uh, so many of the, uh, the children across India are getting their education, a much better education in the private unregistered schools uh, than, than there are in the government schools. So uh, that's another project that I would uh, uh, love to bring to your attention. Slide 24 can show you the websites uh, for finding out more information. Uh, well, thank you again for including me in your program. I hope that it's useful. Feel free to contact me at uh, Hawaii Pacific University or ISIL. Aloha. Which you notice did not appear. Don't worry. I will forward those to you guys so you can put together the uh, story that you heard with the uh, visuals that illustrate those cases that uh, Ken Schoolant was talking about. Uh, we have a couple of minutes, it seems, until the next speaker. Uh, I would like you to feel as comfortable as I hope you are in my classroom, so if you have any questions, the last couple of speakers uh, could not take uh, questions for obvious reasons. They were uh, pre-recorded, so if you would like to ask a question, uh, discuss briefly something before we move to the next speaker. And the next speaker is the founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, Jacob Hornberger. Is he online? Okay, so we can start with this, and if we have uh, time for discussions, we'll do it at the very end. Thank you.
Ja vám mene to relax. getting close to the connection okay okay i didn't realize that okay i think we're good Jay thank you with us do you see the yes we see and hear you well. yes i can see you perfectly okay um okay. you have uh, 15 minutes and uh when only five is left i will uh, i will give you the signal so you know how much time, if you want to uh, leave a couple of minutes maybe for a question. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. It's great to be here with you all celebrating Freedom Week at Northwood. You know, for, for about 100 years now, we've lived under a, a permanent state of crisis in the area of immigration. Uh, every five years or so, the, the controversy bursts into the public arena, and there's uh, these states of uh, anxiety and angst amongst a large segment of the population that the you know, illegal aliens are invading America and things like that. And uh, then there's demands for reform, and whatever reform is adopted, the, the crisis only becomes worse, and, and certainly it continues, so that no matter what they do, it never fixes the crisis, and in fact, it makes the crisis worse. And so we've lived for 100 years under this permanent state of immigration crisis. This shouldn't surprise us, though, because immigration controls are really just a, a form of socialism. Uh, that is, um, socialism in the sense of central planning. Uh, you've got a board of commissars at the federal level planning in a top-down command and control way uh, the what is really one of the most complex labor markets uh, that involved millions of people uh, the, the the commissars uh, pretend to have the what Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit the, the conceit that they can actually plan this complex labor market so they sit there and they decide, after looking at all the data, uh, which um, countries will be permitted to send a certain number of immigrants to the United States. They, they sit there with complex formula, deciding you know, what should be the qualifications of each immigrant, uh, what his educational background will be, what his personal background is. And of course, while they're doing all this planning, circumstances are changing. Now, so it shouldn't surprise us that, that what results from this concept of socialist central planning is what Ludwig von Mises called planned chaos, because that's what central planning always produces, is what socialism produces, chaos. And we, we see this chaos, we see it um, in terms of, of the, uh, what goes on on the border, where people are dying of, of thirst on deserts, dying in the back of, of 18 wheelers an entire black market of, of smugglers called coyotes and um, you know, children massing at the border. I mean, it's just one constant state of crisis and chaos and death, which is what socialism has always been known for, a chaos, crisis, and death. So, and no matter what they do, as I indicated earlier, the situation only gets worse. And, and that's, of course, pursuant to what Ludwig von Mises pointed out in, in his book, Inter uh, in a Crisis of Interventionism, that one intervention uh, inevitably leads to more interventions, which produce more crises, which demand more interventions until you get a, a greater, greater control of government over economic activity. And we, we see this, of course, with the, uh, 
the checkpoints that are on the highways in the southwest where people have to stop and show their papers uh, even though they've never left the country uh, much like they had to do in the in the Soviet Union so there's really only one solution to this and that's the free market there's no other solution the, the, the free market produces the best of everything. It, it, it increases standards of living. It, it, it harmonizes people's interests. And what does a free market uh, immigration system mean? It means open immigration, the, the open borders, the free movements of people back and forth, uh, retaining their citizenship, coming to the United States, traveling, trading, uh, being hired, working in, in, in businesses that are willing to hire them. Uh, in other words, a mutual uh, cooperative effort between, in the labor market, employers and employees. Uh, this obviously increases standards of living. Uh, why? Because we know that in every economic exchange, both sides benefit. They, they give up something they value less for something they value more. We, we, we know that just as a simple truism in trade. So the employer value, uh, gives up something he values less for the labor that he's getting, and then the same applies for the, for the worker. Uh, free markets uh, uh, are enshrined with, in, within a private property concept. We, we, we ask ourselves, why shouldn't a business be free to hire whomever he wants? Uh, it, it's his business, the, the owner of the business, it's his money. Uh, why isn't he free to associate with anyone he wants by hiring whomever he wants? That's what private property is all about. Uh, now, the the critics of, of open borders say, well, borders disappear, Jacob. You know, if you have open borders, borders disappear. Well, that's ridiculous. Simply because people are free to cross a border doesn't mean that a border disappears. Uh, every day, people cross between the Maryland and Virginia borders and the border doesn't disappear. It simply means that when people enter into a different jurisdiction, they're subject to the laws of that jurisdiction. Uh, here in the United States, we have the greatest free movement of, of people zone in history. Uh, it didn't have to be that way. It still doesn't have to be that way. But people are free to cross from one state to another without any controls whatsoever. And, and, and that improves standards of living as well as protects this fundamental right of freedom of movement and freedom of travel. Where, where people have a difficult time is applying that principle internationally. But yet the same principle applies. Free movements of people seeking a better life or simply coming here to tour or visit, what have you. So the free market is the solution. There is no other solution to the immigration crisis. More interventionism is going to lead to more crises and more interventionism and more crises. The, the only solution is, is a free market solution, one based on private property rights. We see the whole world mired in socialism, in statism, and, and we see the, the poverty, the, the impoverishment. We, we see the misery and the suffering. And, and we, we Americans, we advocates of liberty and free markets, we have the opportunity to lead the world out of the status morass. And, and that's what we need to be doing here in the United States, those of us that, that, that recognize the importance and the vitality of free markets. And uh, I suggest that there's no better place to start than in the area of immigration. Thank you very much. Okay, that's a very hot topic and uh, I assume very controversial, so I expect some questions. Okay, if you can approach uh, the microphone and... Uh At the very beginning, I don't know if you were uh, online at the time, I uh, tried a joke uh, outlining the differences between the conservative and the libertarian wings of the free market movement. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll, we'll have uh, some uh, differences of opinion on this issue of immigration. Uh, what if there was like, if it's an open borders, then what about like the Mexican drug cartels, like going back and forth without inspection? Okay, the question is, is what about the, the, all the drug dealers and the drug lords and the drug gangs? Well, here's a classic example of where you have one intervention combined with another intervention. We've had uh, about a century also of the drug war, uh, at least drug laws, uh, for, for several decades, at least from the Nixon administration, we've had the war on drugs. And if there's a bigger disaster than the war on immigrants, it's, it's the drug war. 
I mean, I don't. I think everyone would admit that it's a failure after so many uh, uh, decades, and and even worse than a failure, it's 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 destructive. It's deadly. It kills people. There, there's 60,000 dead people in Mexico in the last six years of, uh, alone, not because of drugs, because of the drug war. So, of course, you know, you know as Alex said, that, that we, we've got this difference between libertarians and conservatives. Libertarians would get rid of this drug war immediately, just like Americans got rid of prohibition of alcohol. It is deadly. It is destructive. And so... We say people have a right to ingest drugs. We may not condone it. We may not approve it. But if you live in a society in which people are put into jail for being drug at drug addicts or for, for putting something in their in their bodies that the government says is not healthy, whether it's alcohol or tobacco or cocaine or sugar or fatty foods, that's not a free society, at least according to libertarians. So to answer your question, we wouldn't worry about it. We'd legalize all drugs and we'd let leave. The distribution of drugs, again, and the possession of drugs, totally to the free market. When he's coming down, I might add that this problem with children massing at the border is a direct consequence of the war on drugs and the violence it's produced in, in Mexico. That's what drove parents to send their kids north. So here you have a classic example of where two interventionist government programs come together to aggravate an already existing crisis. And the usual response is when our government will solve both of them, right? <clears throat> okay. uh, so my question Go ahead. is... How are you going to regulate the tax on immigrants coming to this country? Because for in order for them to work, they need a green card. So it would give more incentives to hire Im immigrants, but not giving them a green card to actually be a citizen. So how would, you, how would it control, I guess, business owners to pay the tax when you know, it won't be regulated? Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, keep in mind that uh, what the term free market means. It means markets that are free of government control. That's what free enterprise means. That doesn't mean a less regulated market uh, or a less controlled market. It means a market that is totally free of government control. In, in, a, in a regime of open borders, there are no green cards. There are no permits. People are simply crossing a border, looking for a job, finding work, and going to work without the government's business. It's none of the government's business what they're doing. And um, are people paying taxes when they go to work? Yeah. Uh, now, of course, you know we libertarians don't like taxes. We don't. We don't like certainly income taxes. But when a person goes to work for a business, certainly he has withholding. He has social security taxes. He has all the normal taxes. But in terms of extra controls, monitoring who's coming in with green cards, giving permits and restrictions, that's what causes the problem. Because government is out there interfering with the market instead of leaving it free of government regulation and control. If you could address in just one minute uh, two uh, popular objections to uh, open borders. One has to do with the fact that people might be coming here and uh, right away use the welfare system to benefit themselves, to benefit their children, going to public schools without having contributed uh, to uh, the budget uh, for those. The other one, the fear that if uh, we get uh, people coming in by the millions, this will take away jobs from the local people, from the uh, native-born uh, American citizens. Okay, on the first point, uh, the, uh, on the welfare state example, I mean, let's keep in mind that immigrants pay taxes. I mean, they pay them indirectly in, in the form of the rent that they pay, you know, property taxes that fund public schools, public hospitals, and so forth. Uh, so it's not like, and they, they pay sales taxes when they're buying automobile, used automobiles or clothing in retail stores. Um, but this notion that immigrants are coming to the United States for welfare is a canard. I mean, I have never heard of one instance where there's been an immigration raid on a welfare agency. Every single immigration raid I've ever heard of is on a private business. And, and why? It's because that's where they're working. Most people that give up everything they have in, in their home countries to come to a country that, where they can't speak English, where they're abused, where they're insulted, these are people that are not coming to get on some kind of welfare check. 
because usually people, that kind of person doesn't have the intestinal fortitude to, to leave his country and come to the United States. It's the people who want to work hard. But, but even more important, those of us who believe in liberty and believe in free markets, we should never permit the status who have forced this welfare state on us to put us in a position of embracing any violation of the principles of liberty just because a, a, a freedom may be putting some stresses and strains on their status system. In fact, I often think that maybe open borders would be the greatest way to bring down and get the, the welfare state dismantled. Because the status would finally say, hey, we don't want our welfare going to immigrants. Let's go ahead and repeal the welfare state, which would be the greatest thing that could ever happen. Uh, on the second question, I forget the second question. What was it? The fear that they come by the millions and take the jobs from us oh, and uh, we'll be unemployed here. Yeah, that's never been the case. I mean, you may dis they may displace workers in the bottom layers of society. But that, the, that increased uh, e economic boost that immigrants bring produces more prosperity in higher level jobs. So, for example, the guy that was at the bottom, instead of out there picking in, in a, you know, crops in a field where, where he's been displaced, he's now working in an automobile store selling you know, r repair parts for not the automobiles that the immigrants are out there buying. And this has been proven the case, the division of labor that comes about from immigration is a boon to economic prosperity. You, you look at open immigration throughout the, the 19th century. I mean, that's our heritage, open immigration. Throughout the 19th century, there were no immigration controls, with the exception of a, a cursory tuberculosis inspection at Ellis Island. And that was one of the most prosperous periods. And I'm sure you all know this in Northwoods, that despite what the state is saying about the Industrial Revolution, this was what brought humanity out of the depths of poverty and part of what was going on throughout the 19th century was not only free enterprise in terms of no income taxes regulations social security medicare public schooling and all these other socialist programs income taxation federal reserve you also had open immigration and the result was the most prosperous period in in history and, and i might add the most charitable uh, period too when people were free to decide for themselves what to do with their own money, and there was no mandatory charity like we have with the welfare state. Well, thank you, Jacob. Everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next speaker for tonight is uh, Jonathan Williams from the American Legislative Exchange Council. Jonathan? Okay, we're waiting a minute to... Can you hear me, Alex? Hi, oh, yeah. We are here. Do you see my students? Absolutely. So everything's fine. You have your 15 minutes. When uh, only five are left on my clock, I'll uh, give you a signal if I have to, in case you want to leave a minute for a, a question at the end. Okay, great. Well, um, good evening, everybody. My name is Jonathan Williams. I am actually a, a graduate of Northwood. I graduated in 2005, so... I, uh, I recognize uh, Griswold there, and uh, yeah, I can say I was in your seats not that many years ago, and doing a lot of these uh, presentations, hearing from national experts and whatnot, and now I find myself in this seat, which is a little bit strange, but uh, nonetheless, uh, here in Washington, D.C., which I like to call the land of make-believe, uh, because we don't do a whole lot right out here, unfortunately, uh, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about what government does wrong when it comes to uh, basically how fiscal policy, as Alex asked me to put it, messes up spontaneous order and the invisible hand theory of economics. And I know that you've all been kind of uh, getting into that side of it. And so I want to talk about a few applications uh, in our work that we do at the state level. And I'm going to trend into a PowerPoint here and show you a few slides of what's going on at the state level and how government is getting in the business of, uh, as we like to say, picking winners and losers in the marketplace instead of allowing for uh, various individuals uh, to, you know, have their uh, self-order, their uh, motivated self-interest uh, bring about spontaneous order and, as Adam Smith would say, the uh, invisible hand of economic theory that brings about greater standard of living, greater levels of prosperity for everybody across the board. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how government uh, doesn't allow for that many times. 
uh, both at the federal level and what we specialize in at my organization, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, we focus on the state level uh, because we actually think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of bad things happening in Washington these days, not a lot of solutions, not a lot of good things happening or things getting done in general. Um, but at the state level, as former Supreme Court Justice Lewis Brandeis famously said, the states are laboratories of democracy, and they're coming up with ideas on how to make things better off, and government closest to the people is generally more responsive to the needs of the people, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on at the state level. So let me bring up a couple of slides here, if I can uh, get the uh, PowerPoint to work. Um, right. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that all right. If you are on social media, you can follow along at, uh, at Tax Economist is my uh, Twitter handle. And um, there's just a little bit about my organization. But as Alex asked me to talk about uh, how fiscal policy um, messes up spontaneous order. And here are what we think are the principles of good tax policy, which are rarely followed, unfortunately. Uh, that is simplicity. It shouldn't take you, uh, you know, tons of hours to do your taxes, to keep your receipts uh, for your income taxes, especially all of you may not have gone through this yet, but you will shortly as you get into the job field and, and start paying income taxes. April 15 starts to become a big chore. Uh, transparency, you ought to know how much uh, people are taxing you and at what levels. And as you learn more about that, the less you like about tax policy. And the area I want to focus on, which I think government really fails when it comes to the free market, is this issue of neutrality and that the government shouldn't be in the business of picking winners and losers. That ought to be done through motivated, self-interested individuals and uh, businesses looking to make themselves better off and their lives better off. And in doing so, through spontaneous order, produce, uh, as we know, uh, the free markets have produced the greatest standard of living and increase in prosperity that we've ever known uh, where it's ever been tried, opposed to central planning through state or federal governments. Now, the issue of government picking winners and losers, we looked at it at the state level. As I mentioned, we think states are laboratories of democracy in that uh, we get to see what works and what doesn't work almost on a test case basis. And a new report that we came out that's available at ALEC.org, and I should mention is authored with me uh, with a fellow Northwood graduate from uh, 2009, I believe, William Freeland from the Economics Department at Northwood, uh, now on staff with me in the tax and fiscal policy uh, area here at ALEC. We put this together to really show how government gets into business of picking winners and losers with the tax code. So fiscal policy, there's so many ways that government can mess up spontaneous order. Uh, I'm just focusing on the tax side, and that is, you know, why is it that government will give a preferential tax treatment to one business over another? Uh, but unfortunately, when government is in the business of taxing income, it starts to get into picking winners and losers and giving special favorites to one industry or one business over another. Uh, it happened in Michigan not too long ago uh, in the Grand Home years where uh, certain, tax serv certain services were taxed. So, for instance, if you wanted to go play golf, that is considered a service, but it was not a taxable service. But if you wanted to go skiing uh, or snowboarding, that was considered a taxable service. So government was picking winners and losers and favoring golf courses, in this case, at the expense of uh, ski resorts uh, uh, that were taxable. And so whenever government has this kind of a power to tax people's income, whether it's your business income or your individual income, it gives government, out of necessity, the power to pick winners and losers. And it does that uh, with a very disturbing trend, both at the local level of government, the state level of government, and certainly the federal level of government here in Washington, D.C. And as you can see here on the slide, just at the state level, governments exempted $228 billion in personal income and business tax uh, earnings and tax exemptions, and another $260 billion in sales tax exemptions that were not taxed because government was giving preferential treatment to that particular uh, area of taxation. Now, even worse, New York uh, is a, really a case study. They have actually given over 52,000 specific grants to specific companies uh, over the last 15 or 20 years. Instead of just lowering taxes for everyone, and that's our argument, is that you have a level playing field, 
low taxes on everyone, uh, and allow spontaneous order to happen when motivated individuals pursue their own self-interest uh, and make everyone better off through the uh, free functioning of the marketplace, some states, and certainly our federal government, have decided this uh, approach of picking winners and losers, over 52,000 specific grants to companies in New York State that the government has decided deserve this special tax treatment. Well, the big question is what about the other companies that they didn't get this because maybe they weren't well connected enough? Uh, this certainly raises issues of potential preferential treatment, certainly, and it may be even worse, uh, perhaps corruption. Um, and so this, um, New York is certainly not the only case. Uh, this has happened across the United States. Unfortunately, there is many times no policy rationale uh, or performance evaluation required for these type of tax expenditures, as we like to say. So government is getting in the business of picking winners and losers because it has the ability to tax your income and knows how uh, to tax that income. Uh, and then finally, our, our final two tax principles here. Now, the other big issue is the sense the government has the ability to tax your income, and this is decided by, unfortunately, the 16th Amendment to our Constitution, which for the first time in the history of the United States, and this was about 100 years ago, it was ratified, the government had now the ability to tax your income. Prior to that, government could not tax your income. It was prohibited by our original Constitution. That's why they needed a constitutional amendment in 1913, the 16th Amendment, to tax your income. Now, unfortunately, since they have this power today, uh, it allows them to pick winners and losers. And the other thing it does is it allows them to play what we say class warfare. And that is targeting certain levels of individuals based on their level of success or the level of their income. Uh, and this is an issue where government it tries to get in the business of redistributing wealth as well. And unfortunately, uh, now at the United States level, we have the most quote-unquote progressive tax system in the world, which means that we tax income at a higher rate the further up you go in the scale. And that's wrong for a lot of categories. It just doesn't work for one thing. And that, uh, as we see across the 50 states, for instance, people are leaving high-tax states continually and going to states like Texas and Florida and states that are actually more hospitable for business environments and lower taxes. They're leaving places like California, for instance, to New York. Um, over the last 10 years, New York has lost over a million and a half people on that to the other 49 states. California has lost about the same, a million and a half people over the last 10 years to the other 49 states. Texas, as you've probably all seen in the news, has been booming. Uh, incomes are growing. They've created more than, I think, half of all the new net jobs created across the United States since the recession in 2008 have been created in Texas. Texas, one of the reasons for their success is a lack of an income tax, where government can't get in that business of picking winners and losers when it doesn't have the ability to tax income. And as it turns out, across the 50 states, there are nine states that do not tax income whatsoever. And we look at this slide here, we compare the nine states that don't tax income and don't allow the government to have that ability of picking winners and losers. And we compare those nine states that we have on the right side of the column here with the nine states that have the highest income taxes, that take the most out of individuals' paychecks. And this is on top of the federal income tax where, remind you now, we have the highest business taxes in the world in the United States at 35% on business income today. We have the most progressive individual income tax in the world where we're taxing more and more for people as they're successful and moving up the income ladder. And at the state level, you can see whether it's state product growth, population growth, even tax receipt growth, and the important category of job growth here, the states without personal income taxes, the states that don't get in that business of picking winners and losers and trying to micromanage the economy through fiscal policy and getting away from that invisible hand theory and getting towards the more central planning theory uh, that we've discussed, look at that. I mean, the proof is really in the pudding. The nine states without the personal income taxes, higher state product growth, uh, more than two to one greater population growth higher tax receipt growth because of the overall economic growth, and then finally, more than two to one greater job growth over the last 10 years. So you can see, as we talk about the states as laboratories of democracy, this is not just theory, the invisible hand uh, working. This is actually in practice, as we see across the 50 states, uh, that this actually is not just theory, it works. It provides higher job growth, higher population growth, and better overall economic growth for everyone when government stays out of the business of picking winners and losers. And you may ask the question, 
um, you know, what happens then uh, to uh, revenue if you don't have an income tax? Well, these states without income taxes actually have uh, other ways, of course, of raising gov- uh, revenue for government, sales taxes, property taxes, and the like. But I think the key for these states is that they value freedom. They value government staying out of the business of picking winners and losers through the income tax. They don't give them that uh, authority. And in all, all of these cases, nearly, they've never given government the authority of picking winners and losers because they don't have an income tax or they've never had an income tax in their history. And so I think, basically, this is the case study, which I think you would be very interesting to kind of look back. Remember, those nine states that do not tax personal income – Look at that growth versus the states that micromanage the economy and uh, and try to pick winners and losers through more central planning approaches. Um, so with that, um, Alex, I'll be happy to take a, a couple of questions uh, if we have time. Okay. The students have the first right to <clears throat> ask a question. I have a question. Um, if uh, you were appointed the uh, legislative czar of uh, Michigan, what is the first thing that you would do? What is the first piece of legislation that you will either dismantle, uh, throw out, or reform in a way that uh, can help the state uh, quickly to catch up with those winners that you pointed out in the last slide? Yes, well, certainly Michigan has done some very good things in the last few years. Of course, you know, we were the butt of every economic joke for about 10 years as we suffered through with the uh, single state recession, as we called it at the time when I was at Northwood. In, in fact, it was very difficult to find a job in the private sector when I graduated in 2005. Uh, so I really had to come out to Washington, D.C. to find employment. We were in rough shape. Uh, Governor Snyder has come in and has made some very important reforms uh, with the legislature. Uh, Michigan now, of course, as you probably have seen, is a right-to-work state, which means that you don't need to join a union uh, to be employed in unionized industry today, which I think is a huge turning point for Michigan that will make the state more prosperous going forward. And if I were Governor Snyder or Governor Schauer, whoever is elected uh, this fall um, for this next four-year term, I would make it a goal. Uh, maybe it can't happen uh, in day one, certainly, maybe not even in year one or year two, but I would make it a long-term goal to make sure government starts to wean itself off of the business of picking winners and losers by eliminating, over time, Michigan's income tax and becoming the 10th state in the United States with no personal income tax where government doesn't have the power at the state level to know how much you earn, to track you, to audit you. It doesn't have the power to pick winners and losers. And if you're a business owner, maybe many of you will be when you graduate, um, if you're not politically connected enough after you graduate and start a business, maybe your competitors are. What happens then? They get the special preferential treatment. You don't. You're at a huge disadvantage. I would want government to get out of that business altogether, and by doing that, getting rid of the ability to tax income at the state level. Thank you, Jonathan. Round of applause for our guest tonight. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Okay. To wrap up the night, we have three... Presidents and founders, one from Michigan, one from England, and one from Austria. First is the director and founder of uh, the Acton Institute, Reverend Robert Sirico. Then comes the director and founder of the Adam Smith Institute in the United Kingdom, Edmund uh, Eamon Butler. And finally, the president of the Hayek Institute, Barbara Cohn. We have those. Hello, I'm Father Robert Sirico, and I'm the co-founder and president of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty here in Grand Rapids. I've been asked to address you uh, on the topic of uh, the free market and morality, basically, or Christian defense of the free economy. And I only have about 15 minutes to do that in, so I'd just like to recommend uh, a book that you might want to get if you want to go more deeply into the subject than I'm able to do now. And that's a book that I wrote uh, just a little while ago, uh, Defending the Free Market, The Moral Case for a Free Economy. And there are lots of references in this book as well, and I try and take on some of the arguments, of course, that I'm not going to be able to cover in this brief period of time together. But it's a very important topic, because if you think about it, especially those of you who are in business or going into business, Almost every time we talk about economics, or you hear the talking heads and the pundits on the 
television screen or read in the newspapers uh, anything about economy, there is a moral undertone or a set of moral presuppositions, either for or against, either people in the business world are making money because they're greedy or prosperity helps the poor, whether you come at the question from any angle. I want to make a, a brief case for uh, the moral defense of a free economy, but I want to qualify what I say right at the outset so that you understand uh, the what I think are very critical distinctions that need to be made. The, the first thing that I am not saying is that simply because you make a profit, you're a moral person. I think there's a difference between virtue and uh, uh, practicality. I think there's a difference between virtue and pragmatism and a difference between virtue and um, the efficiency of a market economy. You can be very efficient in selling human beings but I think that's an immoral act, and uh, that would be one of the first things I'm saying. I don't believe that just because a person has gotten wealthy that they're a good person. St. Augustine, in one of his uh, sermons uh, reflecting on the story of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, you may recall the story, it's where Lazarus is poor and uh, sick and laying at the feet of the rich man's banquet where the dogs are licking his wounds and the rich man uh, ignores him and then it ends up that Lazarus finds himself in the bosom of Abraham namely in heaven and the rich man finds himself in the flames of hell and there is a great gulf fixed between the two of them St. Augustine in commenting on that passage in the New Testament said Lazarus was not in heaven because he was poor. He was in heaven because he was humble. And the rich man was not in hell because he was rich, but because he was proud. Uh, I think this kind of distinction is important because uh, wealth is only a sign that you have uh, planned your economic activities well. You've planned uh, certain things to accomplish and you accomplish them and the result of that from an economic point of view from a, an accounting point of view is what we call profit and that brings me to another point uh, profits are simply an economic sign which means that they are an indicator of whether or not you have met the subjective needs of people as they've determined in their transactions with you uh, again, a person can make a profit doing a lot of immoral things. I guess what I'm saying from a moral point of view, from a philosophical or theological point of view, is that freedom, as important as it is, should not be seen as a virtue. It is rather the context in which virtue is possible, but also vice is possible. So a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Edmund Opitz, who used to teach at the Foundation for Economic Liberty in Irvington, New York, used to say something to the effect that every kind of vice and evil that you will see people committing in their free acting and in their relationships, you will see manifested in the market because that is in fact what the market is. It's voluntary relationships. So to talk about the moral basis of capitalism or the moral basis of a free economy, I prefer to qualify that by saying it is the moral potential of a market economy. Now let me go into that for just a few moments, which would address, by the way, the question of slavery too. Why is it immoral for people to trade corn, or uh, let me rephrase that, why is it moral for people to trade corn but not to trade human beings. And that brings us to the question of anthropology, that is, asking ourselves who human beings are. And this is why I think the Judeo-Christian ethic gives us a solid basis for a free economy. Uh, it is no mistake in my mind that it is in the Western world that uh, economics as a discipline emerges 
and uh, results in prosperity when you limit the intrusion of others and high taxations, when you have the rule of law and the right to contract. It's because the Judeo-Christian ethic had as its base a certain view of the human person. And basically, and very simply, that view of the human person is two sets of things that the human person is simultaneously. So the first set of things that a human being is is material. That's the most obvious thing about the human person is we, we see each other, we can touch each other, uh, we can hear each other, and we engage in the material world. The second thing, even though that's true, that's not the whole truth of who human beings are, it's also true that human beings are transcendent beings. Now you could describe this in a lot of different ways, philosophically and theologically, but in the broadest language of uh, a common grammar that I could uh, offer you so that people of no religious tradition or uh, any number of Christian traditions would agree that the human being is somehow more than just his material parts, that we have dignity over the animals, that we have a personhood that distinguishes us from the animals by virtue of the fact that we can love not just instinctually, but intentionally and according to our will. We can appreciate art. Uh, we can plan uh, the future. And because of that transcendent capacity of the human person in our nature again, we have the ability to draw out from nature things that are mere resources and transform them in a way that places them at the service of others. So what we call a market process. The entrepreneur discovers things that other people had left undiscovered or process whereby we can um, serve the needs of others uh, depending on what their needs are and their freedom to act on their own behalf. The other set of things that human beings are is that we are both individual and social simultaneously. By that I mean from the first moment of our existence we are biologically distinct from our mothers even within her womb but we are in relationship to our mother. And then as we grow up and we go through life that dual nature if you will without being dualistic philosophically but that's another question but that dual nature of being individual and social simultaneously is played out in the whole of our lives. We can become, uh, we make choices, we can become uh, the kinds of people that we choose to be, but we're always in relationship with others. The fact that language exists is proof that we are social animals. The fact that we have to learn from others and build on that knowledge and eventually leave legacies is an indication that we are social beings. So we are individual and social, we are material and transcendent or spiritual, and these two sets of uh, realities that demarcate every human being is what begins the understanding, this anthropological presupposition, begins the understanding of why property is important. Now let me say a thing or two about property. Property emerges from the process of the human person using his intellect, his wit, his ability, his know-how, and his freedom, and mixes that with the resources of the world. Uh, resources are not yet wealth. Wealth is the result of human creativity. In fact, one of the popes said once that man is man's greatest resource, that it's this human intellect that discovers and draws out from the world property. And so property uh, is rightly our own by not just the commandments, thou shalt not steal, but by nature itself. So that's one of the first things that provides the foundation for understanding the universe. Animals don't relate to the world in the same way that human beings do. They relate to the world based on instinct, whereas man relates to the world based on reason, this choice, this reason, this intelligence, this ability to plan a beaver, even though it can build a dam, even though it can build a, a, a shelter for itself and its family, never creates 
uh, a hotel for beavers and rents out rooms to other beavers because they lack that capacity to uh, uh, plan and integrate knowledge in, in the way reasoning man does. Now, there are lots of questions that, that arise in the discussion of the morality of free enterprise. Uh, I'm often asked, uh, what about greed? Well, of course, greed isn't the monopoly of uh, people active in a market economy, is it? Uh, greed is really an inordinate desire. And monks in monasteries can be greedy about things. Poor people who have very little can also be greedy. In fact, they might, you might make the case that uh, people who have less material possessions are even more materialistic precisely because they have to seek and find those things every day. They don't have a store of them available to them. So it really, when we talk about greed, we have to talk about the flip side of that, which is envy. And I think if there's any one vice that the more command and controlled economies, the more collectivist economies promote, it is the, the vice of envy, where when someone succeeds, you immediately presume that they are succeeding at someone else's expense. Uh, this really in eco economics is called the zero-sum game, that the world of wealth is a pie that needs to be divided up rather than a pie that can be grown. And this is another aspect of the moral dimension uh, of uh, free economy. And that is all that I've said before about the nature of the human person tells us something about man's capacity to work. And work has great dignity in the scriptures. Even before the fall in the book of Genesis, God already gives a vocation to human beings uh, to multiply and have possession of the earth and to have stewardship responsibility for the creation. And so we see this as well. In the parables of Jesus, we see a number of wonderful examples of praising industriousness, praising uh, the conserving value and the productive value of an ethical system uh, rooted in uh, the morality of Christ. I'm thinking of the parable of the talents, of course, where the three servants are given uh, various talents and told that the master will go away and will come back to get and see what they've done uh, with those talents. And one has just hidden the talent, another has multiplied it by, by five, and another has multiplied it by ten. And Jesus says that those uh, rewards those who have been the most productive. Now that doesn't sanction every activity uh, that is productive in a market economy, but it does tell us something about the fact that God entrusts gifts to us in our person and expects us to be generous with those gifts, uh, industrious with those gifts, uh, creative with those gifts. And this really kind of brings us back to the whole uh, idea of work and your own work in the vocation of business. And I call it a vocation quite intentionally, uh, vocare from the Latin meaning to call. God calls each one of us to be creative. And uh, you will find uh, your vocation by your search for excellence. I think everyone who seeks excellence is really in a way seeking God because God is the excellent, the root of all excellence, uh, pure truth. So uh, I hope this little discussion about natural law and the scriptures and the moral defense of the free economy will be helpful in your studies. But I hope even more so that in your various vocations of business that you will take the work that you do very seriously and ignore the kinds of hectoring complaints of people who uh, often want to uh, inhibit your creative uh, talents and want to confiscate the property that you have rightly and justly and morally produced by your enterprise. God bless.
Hello, welcome to Vienna. My name is Barbara Kolm. I'm the president of the Hayek Institute and the director of the Austrian Economic Center, both here in Vienna and the United States. Um, we bring back the Austrians not only to Austria, but to the world. So what I would like to discuss with you in the next couple of minutes is what is the Austrian School about? By who was it founded? Who were the principal agents of the Austrian School? What is their theory? What is their background? And what do we aim for in these days? So just to give you a, a quick overview, the Austrian School was founded by Karl Menger, who was a professor and he was a teacher of Crown Prince Rudolf back in the 1870s. He also was the author of The Principles of Economic Theory, which was a brand new book back then because it turned the theory that was existing until then upside down entirely. So what are these Austrians about? Not only that it's an old tradition, but it's more than that. It's not only a theory of economics, it's a theory, it's a mindset. It is, it's a way of living. Austrian economics is no mainstream economics. Still, you know all about the Keynesianisms and many other theories. Austrian economics is different from that. Austrian economics is also a theory of action. It's not about decision making. It's about action. It's about, it's about the individual who is centered in the, in the thinking. So the Austrians, as I said, consider competition as a discovery process, which is very important. So we embrace a couple of things that in some societies are taken for granted and in others are not. So for example, competition, as I pointed out, one thing. The next thing is the achievement principle, which is also not for granted, uh, at least in our Western affluent societies. People consider everything is being provided by the government or by the state, which is not true. We have to achieve, we have to work for those things ourselves. The next thing that, is the, uh, that uh, makes a big difference between the Austrian School of Economics and many other theories is the values that the Austrians stand for. And of course, it's individual choice, which is a precondition for uh, for every decision-making process and for economic growth and well-being of a society. And last but not least, self-responsibility. Self-responsibility is a precondition also for a working or for a society that is working and that is growing. So again, there are three things that make a difference from the Austrian School of Economics to many other theories. So it's a theory of action for the first thing. It's not mainstream economics as a second thing. And of course, it's about the creation of knowledge in society. And talking about creation of knowledge in society, there is one outstanding representative of the Austrian school. Of course, he's an Austrian by birth. Uh, it's Fritz Hayek or Friedrich von Hayek, who was born in 1899 in Vienna and uh, unfortunately left Austria in the early 30s of the last century to move to London, where he was teaching at the London School of Economics. And from there, his career path took him to Chicago. And later in the 60s, he returned to uh, Europe, actually then to Freiburg in Germany. And then a couple of years, he was teaching in Salzburg. And during this time, in 1974, he was awarded the Nobel Prize of Economics and for his groundbreaking work, uh, work on the creation of knowledge in society, as I pointed out. But of course, there were many other representatives of the Austrian school as well. So I'll give you a brief uh, history of the Austrians, as we call them here in Austria. Uh, as I said already, the founder was, uh, was Karl Menger, and he was actually the one who was influencing the most. The next generation, he was the founder. The next generation of the Austrians were Friedrich von Wieser and of course uh, Eugen von Böhm-Bawerk, who was twice federal minister of finance in Austria during the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was the one who was fighting against inflation for the first time in Austria and also against sovereign debt. I mean, and of course, the rise of taxes. You have to imagine back then the taxes and the Austrian Empire were 
between 7 and 10 percent on income. I mean, this is nothing uh, in comparison to what we see these days in Western Europe with tax marginal tax rates uh, close to 50 percent and in some places even more. So he was also already a defender of limited government and of more individual freedom and of more entrepreneurship. And talking about entrepreneurship, there is a second generation of Austrians. One of them represented is Schumpeter, known for the, the theory of creative destruction. He claimed that, of course, you have to destroy something or it, uh, before something new can be created. We all know that uh, the creation of knowledge, as Hayek determined it, is uh, done by individuals. So you, the individuals detect something and elaborate on these things. Uh, Schumpeter coming in from the other side, uh, claiming that the entrepreneur is the one who can make the changes, who knows exactly what the market demands. It's not the e economist who, in theory, can determine things. No, no, no. It's the entrepreneur who knows exactly what is needed. And talking about the second generation of the Austrians, there is one individual who is best known all around the world for his defense, uh, or actually his work against socialism. And he already predicted that communism would not work in the 1920s of the last millennium. Um, so this name, of course, is, is uh, Ludwig von Mises. Mises was the teacher of Hayek and of the next generation of the Austrians. He already had this famous Mises circle, which was nothing else but a discussion group after work where philosophers, uh, lawmakers, uh, economists met to discuss the current ideas, what was going on in the world. And this group actually determined a lot of new economic theory. So the third generation of the Austrian school, starting with Friedrich von Hayek, um, was also well known for their theory on the concept of society, on how competition changes the world, and of course the business cycle theory, which Hayek and Mises worked together in the 1920s of the last millennium. Again, the Austrian school is no equilibrium theory. It doesn't have models. That's a big difference to many other schools of economics. It's not about specific forecasts, which is also very important, because the Austrians considered that there is no such thing as full information. Even in times of Blackberries and iPhones and iPads and uh, Google and Wikipedia and everything, there is no such thing as full information, which is very important. You can never determine under the X, Y, Z, what will be the results of something. This is also important and we, can, we have seen this with the recent crisis. There are always booms and busts and this is what the Austrian economic theory is about as well. Where are the roots of the Austrians? We did not talk about that. So the roots of the Austrians were not only in the Scottish Enlightenment, but they were also at the Spanish scholastics. So it's a long theory, and this comes back to the values that they represent. What are the key elements? It's entrepreneurship, it's the concept of society, it's competition, and again, the business cycle theory. But there are various terms that we need to determine and to use when we are talking about the Austrians. For the first time, time and value were defined and were brought into economic theory. The second group, a pair, that was used by the Austrians for the first time in economic theory was money and credit, which is another very important part of the Austrian school. The next one was business and competition, which was also determined by the Austrians. And last but not least, it was the creation of knowledge in society. So these are the frameworks that the Austrians work with. As I pointed out, it's not mainstream economics. It's about the individualist versus the collectivism. 
So the Austrians, if I use all these terms, I always try to bring in examples. And the Austrian theory of society, it's the individual who thinks and acts. It's the methodological individualism, as Hayek pointed it out. Not government thinks and acts, not the anonymous masses. It's the individual who makes these decisions. And again, it's a theory about the hum of human action versus the decision making. And it's about um, business and capital, as we already discussed. We already talked about the many Austrian representatives. But I would like to bring those five terms that we discussed before again into focus. It's individual choice first, which is that you yourself know best what is good for you. It's not government, it's the individual who knows. It's entrepreneurship. It's because the entrepreneur can predict or can see what the demand is on the market. It's not the theorist you can, uh, who, who, dis who makes those decisions. However, you have to consider that the entrepreneur is the risk taker and he takes action as well. Then, of course, we need as, a free, as, a, as an environment a free and competitive markets. So again, it's about little government or the least possible uh, framework that we need to have. Talking about frameworks, what do you think is important that the government provides? Just the rule of law? Well, you should discuss this in class. I don't think you need more. But this is a precondition. So what the Austrians also discovered, or what was important to them back then last in the last century, was they didn't make a decision between micro and macroeconomics. Um, they considered everything important. Last but not least, private property. The Austrians determined private property as a precondition for a free society. Of course, if you do not protect your own, your, your, your ownership of anything, you are lost. Private property and the protection thereof is a precondition for capitalism. And if we forget about that, then we are a bunch of collectivists who redistribute, and I don't think that re redistribution will work forever. After all, and this is also what the Austrians said, we are all different. There is no such thing as equality on Earth and also back somewhere else. So to provide the same, uh, or the, the same framework and to provide uh, the same Das mit dem Equality muss man neu machen. There is no such thing as equality as the Austrians determined it. You have to provide the same access for an equal access for everybody. But luckily, we are all different and we have e uh, different talents. This means also that you know the one size fits all policies that governments provide do not work. Just to sum up, again, the Austrian school is not mainstream economics, but it's more than a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's about the achievement principle. It's about competition. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about the functioning of a price system. It's about little or less influence by government. It's about little governments. And most importantly, it's about self-responsibility. Thank you. And I do look forward to seeing you back in Vienna here at this beautiful city where the roots of the Austrians are. The Adam Smith Institute. And I sometimes catch some of my students uh, Smiling, perhaps, sometimes, as I'm thinking from one language to the next, I would uh, either lose my thought or use a foreign word. Um, okay, we have Eamon Butler, the uh, president of the and founder of the Adam Smith Institute from the United Kingdom.
I'm Eamon Butler from the Adam Smith Institute here in London, and I'd like to talk to you about Public Choice School of Economics. Public Choice uh, Economics uses the tools of eco economics to explore how political institutions work and how political decisions are made. And it produces some surprising insights that challenge the whole legitimacy of political decision making. To most people, it may be odd to use economics to study the political system because economics seems to be all about private profit, while government is supposed to be about public benefit. But economics is not just about money. It's about the choices we make every day, such as will the view from the next hill be worth the effort of climbing it? How much time should we spend in finding exactly the right birthday card for a friend? These are economic decisions. They involve weighing up how much time or effort we think it's worth spending to achieve our aims. Economists have developed some very simple but useful tools for this very task. They include ideas such as cost, the value you place on what you give up, say your time or effort, and benefit, the value of what you gain, such as the right birthday card or the fine view. The difference between the value you put in uh, and what you give up is the, uh, the value that, that is your profit. Although, if you can't actually find a nice card, um, or the view disappoints you, it could equally well be your loss. Public choice is about applying these simple economic concepts to the study of how collective political choices are made. It applies them to such things as the design of constitutions, election mechanisms, political parties, pressure groups, the bureaucracy, legislatures, um, committees and other parts of government. Collective political decisions such as whether to raise property taxes to build a new road are just as economic as any other. They involve a choice between costs and benefits. But in politics there's a twist. When you make an economic choice you feel both the costs and the benefits yourself. In democratic choices, however, the people who benefit are not always the people who bear the cost. Also, in economic markets, both sides have to agree. If either the buyer or the seller is not content, they can just walk away. In politics, however, the minority cannot walk away. They're forced to accept the decision of the, mi of the majority. Unfortunately, that makes it easy for a self-interested group uh, a majority to exploit the minority by voting themselves public benefits that the minority have to pay for. James M. Buchanan uh, received the 1986 Nobel Prize for demonstrating that problem and for showing how constitutional restraints uh, might help to solve it. The so-called welfare economists of the late 20th century strove to identify the costs and benefits of policy options and then calculate how social welfare might be maximized. They thought this would inform and improve public decision making. But they assumed that such decisions would be made rationally by enlightened and impartial officials in the public interest. Public choice economics shattered this illusion. It's accepted that public decision making is needed for some tasks uh, uh, it's collective action, uh, but that process falls very far short of the ideal. That's because the people who make public decisions are just as self-interested as anybody else. People don't suddenly become angels when they get a job in government. So it rocked mainstream economics when Buchanan and his co-author Gordon Tullock applied this economic view to the institutions of government. Even more shocking was their conclusion that political decisions are actually less efficient, less rational, and more exposed to private interests than the decisions that are made in the marketplace. Politics is supposed to be about the public interest. But what does public interest mean? Perhaps one group of people want a new road, but another is violently opposed to it, and they want lower taxes instead. And maybe a third thinks the money should be spent on defense, fourth on hospitals, and a fifth on welfare. These utterly contradictory views can't be added together to reveal some sort of public interest. Rather, public choice sees voting and legislating as economic processes in which people pursue their own often conflicting interests. And different decision-making processes will lead to very different outcomes. Under majority voting, for example, if 51% 
uh, vote for the new road, then that is what is chosen, even if the other 49% object. But if you need unanimity, then a single objector can stop the road. And if you had a two-thirds majority rule, the pro-road lobby would have to probably modify their proposals in order to compromise with the objectors. So there's no definitive right or wrong answer as to whether the road should be built or not. It, it depends on the voting system. But even at the best of times, voting may not actually reflect the true views of the voters. People often vote tactically rather than in line with their true opinions. They may calculate that their preferred candidate has little chance of winning, and they vote instead for someone that they deeply dislike in order to keep out another candidate that they really hate. And voting becomes dominated by small groups with very strong interests. People who would benefit from the road, for example, have a powerful and direct incentive to raise funds and campaign strongly for the project. By contrast, the massive taxpayers may figure that the cost of the road would be spread rather thinly between them, uh, and even though they are in the majority, they'll have much less incentive to campaign against the project, and their dissent will go unheard. Interest groups also get together to create majority coalitions, so different groups who all want new roads in their districts may form a broad pro-road campaign that, if successful, will benefit every one of them. Meanwhile, candidates for office try to create electoral majorities by bidding for the votes of these highly motivated interest groups. It's great for the special interests, but for the general public, well, they lose out. Political parties want to get elected. Their best chance of doing that, it may be, to adopt policies that appeal to the large mass of voters in the centre. And that's why we see parties bunching together at the centre, which of course again leaves non-centrist electors largely unrepresented. And when elected, politicians trade votes in order to push their own policy through. It's called log rolling. They make agreements with other, other people in the legislature saying, you vote for my measures and I'll vote for yours. And they do, with the results that more legislation is passed than anybody actually wants. The growth of government is also boosted by the self-interest of civil servants. They want the security, salary and status of a large department with a big budget, so they talk legislators in, in, into uh, expanding and increasing the rules and regulations that they are in charge of. And again, what's missing in that process is the voice of the public who have to pay for all these measures and suffer all of these regulations uh, and their effects. The self-interest and irrationality of all of this is why we need strong constitutional restraints on the political process. Without such restraints, majorities will always be exploiting minorities, and interest groups will always get their way, but the general public will not. Public choice economics is having a powerful impact on political science. It's led to some major rethinking of the very nature of elections, of legislatures and bureaucracies, and whether the political process is actually better than the market process. You've heard of market failure, but all too often it's clear that the real problem is government failure.